Hi, thank you for joining me for Bible study. And we're continuing our tour through the ancient landmarks. Just significant passages, verses of scripture that have been landmarks for generation after generation. And it's a list that I made up on my own based on history and things like that. And so we looked in, in Exodus where God describes himself, that he is the Lord, that he is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, that he is abounding in covenant love and faithfulness. And we just kind of looked at the significance of that. And then, you know, we looked at Psalm 23 for something different there, right? Where David tells us of his relationship with the shepherd. Well, we're moving forward into the New Testament. And I know I'm skipping over some really good ones that we could have done, but we didn't. And... It's one that has been a landmark for generation after generation within the church. And it is the model prayer or the Lord's Prayer. And it's recorded in two different places. But we're going to be looking at the one in Matthew chapter 6, embedded within the Sermon on the Mount. And this is how it reads in my Bible. In this manner, therefore pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Just a simple prayer, but it's a it's a model. It is a um, a template, and so there's a lot jammed in it that Jesus has given us that we can expand on as we meditate on on praying this and. I was looking in uh, in one teaching of the Lord's Prayer, and in that one, uh, it was from Martin Luther. He had whole elaborate prayers just from each line. And what stood out from to me in his multiple prayers there was how much he prayed for the lost to be saved. He had a heart for the lost to be saved. And so it's not meant to be always recited in the same way, but you can, and that's part of the power of it, is it has been recited in many, many, many languages, in many, many, many times, in many different locations. It's something we can all cling to. As Jesus teaches us a way to pray that's different than what we see in the Psalms or in those other passages of the, Old, of the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures. And one of the things that really stands out is the intimacy as he teaches us to pray to our Heavenly Father. I think it's easy as New Covenant believers to, to take that for granted. But that we get to call the God of the universe Father as we have been both born again by faith in Jesus Christ, we've been given a new heart, as was promised in Jeremiah and Ezekiel and, and reiterated in the New Testament. But we've also been adopted into the family. And that is a, a security in that. We've been chosen by him to be brought into his family. And as a father, then, he's putting himself in a position 
to be obligated to take care of us. Because that's what a father is supposed to do. To provide, to protect, to give his presence, his, his closeness. So while he's in heaven, we have an intimacy with him. So our father in heaven. But even in intimacy, there's not to, we're not to lose that he's also holy, transcendent. He is fully righteous and without sin or shadow even. Hallowed be your name. And it's a name that we now carry and that we represent him into the world. Holy is your name. And that he is the king, right? That his kingdom is coming. And so, something that I've been praying on more this year is, is that he is the king. Does he really rule in my life? Does it show that I am subject to him, that I am his follower? And so, praying for him to have his kingdom come in my life, his kingship. Because it's not a kingdom defined by geography, but by his spirit. And so, the only way to know where his kingdom is, is for his spirit to be manifest, for the fruit to be present in the lives of those who are under his kingship in the kingdom, right? And as king, that his will be done on earth, in my life, even as it is in heaven. And that I want his will in my life, as I was just praying a little bit ago, that I'd rather have God's best even when it's not good right now because God's best is the eternal perspective and so it's a lot of surrendering on my part and it is on all of us that his will be done and I notice that as I meditate and pray on this it does start with God's business before it starts with my business. There's worship, there's praise. You know, we learn different acronyms for prayer. Um, but starting with that adoration, that praise for the God in heaven who allows me to call him Father. And he is holy, without sin, and he wants that in my life. And that kind of prompts me to repent and to cry out for help. And that I yield to his will. And that I ask for what I need. And I'm really blessed in that God has provided for needs and wants in ways beyond what I deserve or even really expect. Um, I've got it good. So I try to be generous and, and to work with that. But again, there's other things in my life that I need daily, hourly, moment by moment. It's like, oh God, I can't do it without you but that he's going to provide. Because man can't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And I find more and more that it is vital to have time in God's word and that I need it. And that part of the reason I know I need it is because it's hard to get it. Yeah. 
I still need a new heart. He's given me a new heart, but I need more new heart all the time. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts. And that's something that comes with walking with God is more and more realization of my sinfulness. Because he's very holy and I'm very not. He's still working on me. And so with that repentance is the accepting forgiveness. Because God is quicker to forgive myself than I am myself. I can kick myself for a long time over things that he's already forgiven. And it doesn't do him or me any good to do that. But I want to make sure I learn the lesson so I don't repeat those mistakes, right? So forgive us our debts, my sins, where I've fallen short. I've been a few pennies short of the dollar. I've been a dollar short of the dollar most of the time. And in my receiving forgiveness, then that I will be quicker to forgive. When people do me wrong, when people short me, proper respect or proper anything. As a fellow brother or sister in Christ or just as a human being. But that I forgive, even if they don't even know that they did wrong and much less ask for forgiveness but just giving that over to god doesn't mean i have to trust it doesn't mean that everything's hunky-dory but it does mean that those slights those wrongs those hurts i give them over to god and say you're going to have to take care of that your justice is more thorough and more just than me holding on to bitterness or grudges or worse, trying to get my own revenge because I've learned I'm not very good at that anyways. And so forgiveness, just as I'm forgiving others. And he's put a little tag there at the end of this that I didn't read, but it's there in verses 14 and 15 where Jesus reinforces that thought. If you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Hanging on to those hurts, hanging on to those, those wrongs they did so we can hold it against them, bring it up when we want to feel better about ourselves, or just when we want to get angry. No, but forgiving, going on. Then verse 13, do not lead us into temptation. And that's one where the word temptation usually is in our minds an enticement to evil. And we, we know God's without sin, so why would he be enticing us to evil? But that's not what it's getting at. The word temptation is really just a test. Now, maybe for some of you, when you were in school, every test was an opportunity to fail. And, and that's true. Tests, for some of us, though, were maybe opportunities to succeed and do well. Maybe we were good test takers, even if we weren't good students. But it's about that idea of being tested. And Jesus knows what he's talking about there as he says that. And Matthew tells us that because, well, in chapter 4, it was the Spirit who led Jesus into the wilderness to be tested. Tempted is even the word that my translation uses. And so he had been led into that. But without sin, as he endured for 40 days, temptations and challenges and testing, he came forth stronger, better. And we find that numerous times in his life, he was tested, he was challenged. And yet he kept finding the strength from the Father. He found his deliverance through the Holy Spirit so that he can be a faithful high priest, that we can come to him to find help in our time of need to overcome the evil one, to overcome evil within 
and the enticement from without. That we, even when we are tested, and some of those tests are really hard, aren't they? I know some folks, it just feels overwhelming. The test is, is too much. And that's when we fall back on the Good Shepherd and say, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And so just hold close to the shepherd to deliver us. Because it all belongs to him. I know some of your translations may leave off that last line, but I like it. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. That it all belongs to him. It's all for him and through him and in him and to him. And with him. And so let us look to him in prayer. And there's another one of those that just to demonstrate. Let's try to memorize these. Let's try to dig in and and put these in our heart. So that we can pull them out and meditate on them in our time and our praying and our talking to God. That he is our father. He is our Lord. He is our king. And that he would be glorified in our life. Both as we give him thanks for what he has done and as we look to him for what he will provide in the future. Because he is the one who is good. We want his will to be done. It is a solid landmark to guide us, to guide us home. God bless, God keep you. Thanks for praying. We'll see you next time.